All right, everyone. Welcome to lecture 10. It should be April 5th, actually, not March 31st. Just for a sec, my pen is not working. There you go. Okay, so in today's lecture, we'll be talking about layer norm, a bit of batch norm too. So these are regularization methods that are very popular these days, especially deep neural networks. Um, we'll be talking about bi-pair encoding and teacher forcing, beam search, greedy search, exhaustive search. So it's rather than these topics are related to each other. It's more of a diverse topics, or I will say things that we didn't really talk about, but will be really important for you to understand transformer and also modern NLP. So today's lecture will be very useful for in that regard. And we'll be finishing up with language model, which is some, some actually some in some classes, actually language model is the first thing that the instructors discuss for many reasons, because NLP, some people uh, actually argue that, and I think that's actually true. NLP at the core is basically language model. But from the application side, I think language model is a more advanced topic than other things. That's why I moved it to here. At this point, it's easier to understand what language model is than covering this initially. I think classification or token classification is a bit I mean, the sentence classification or token classification is probably a bit more intuitive task than language model for many of you who started NLP for the first time. Okay, so let's go over each of these, but as always, we'll be beginning with announcements and a bit of a recapping what we did in last lecture and how it connects to today's lecture. So number one is that assignment two is out and it's due in two weeks from today. So I'm sorry that it was, I was planning to release it on last Wednesday, but it was released yesterday. And because of that, I gave you more than two weeks to work on them, work on the assignments. It will be due at 11 PM from two weeks from today, Monday. So make sure to start working on them early enough. Thank you for your assignment one. It will be graded and we'll aim to aim for grading it, aim for finishing the grading by when the assignment two is due. So hopefully by then you will get the, your scores. And for the next two weeks, including today's lecture, we'll be covering diverse topics in LP. And today's lecture was more about the, uh, the regularization techniques and some decoding techniques. We'll be also talking about language modeling parsing, retrieval, multimodal learning, and dialogue. These are all important topics in LP. It's just that it's easier to explain these after covering the really, uh, the more of um, the core things like token classification, sent sentence classification, and generation. And the final project. So I think at least a few of you already have emailed me. I think, and I think I approved all of them up to now. So when you're emailing, emailing me, please make sure to meet and also mention the following conditions. So of course, uh, please tell me about your project, but also make sure that you mention these two, that first of all, you are submitting the work to an appropriate venue. So I will not allow projects that's not targeted for any publication. That's because I mean, in that case, then I think it, it, it can become very, I would say, not, not um, in many cases, it's hard to keep up the quality of the work. So you have to work on something that's being submitted to uh, some venue. 
conferences, basically, venues, conference, workshop. Of course, conferences recommended, but if you're working towards workshop, that's fine too. And number two, this is a really important thing I mentioned last class. You have to be the first author or a co-first author to be eligible. So please make sure to mention this too. So I, I just want you to not just helping the project, but you're actually leading the project. You'll, you'll be the lead author of the project. And that of course applies to everyone who is involved in the project. I mean, if you are working on a project and more than more than one of you are in this class to replace that with the, replace it for the final project, then you both of you have to be the first author. If only one of you is the first author, then the other one actually have, has to work on the final project or maybe replace the final project with another project, not this project that you are helping as a second or third author. So I believe this, everything is clear. Please, please ask me anytime if you have a question. Okay. So let's go for a quick recap about what we discussed last week. So we went over transformers. So on Monday, I explained you the the mathematical, or um, I would say more of the um, non-code details of transformer. And on Wednesday, we went over the annotate transformer by Alex Rush, and it was um, basically details how the everything can be implemented on PyTorch. And really, the the message I wanted to really convey was that transformer was the idea of transformer was to entirely remove RNNs through positional encoding and use self-attention only. And this basically allows us to enable, uh, allows us to enable GPU parallelization, speed up a lot of different things. And also attention itself actually is quite useful as you saw, probably you'll also see this experimentally in your assignment too, that attention helps a lot in many tasks, including question answering, machine reading comprehension. And the work also proposed multi-head attention, and this enables us to really model complex behaviors compared to just single-head attention. And decoder side attention was a bit different from the encoder side in that it has two layers of attention, and the first layer has mask multi-head attention, this one. And that's basically you're decoding one token at a time. So because of this, the attention should not look forward when you're training. And that's why we are making it unidirectional attention for decoding. So all these characteristics enable the model to be scaled up and simplified, which lets us to be more free from model-centric paradigm and focus on other more important things, especially uh, data or how we train it Etc. Of course, the details of the model is really important too, but Transformer has become really the standard in NLP that now people worry less about the model these days. And we went over the annotate Transformer to see how this works in PyTorch. And I told you that the uh, PyTorch version is a bit outdated, so it could be a bit more simplified, I think, with the current PyTorch version, like 1.8. But I hope you get the point and we walk through this in last lecture 09. So coming from this, I think you remember that in the last part of the annotate transformer, there were a few, I would say, topics that we did not discuss. And these topics were, for instance, how the layer norm works, how the uh, bi-pair encoding works, what it, what it is, of course, first of all, and also how beam search uh, compared to greedy search works. And these are more of a, I would say, things that you will be very, it will be really good for you to know because they are more of a modern NLP techniques that are used throughout a lot of different works. So I'll be devoting a bit of today's lecture on that and then finishing up with language model discussions, which is also very important, of course, in today's NLP community 
Okay, so before we go into layer normalization, we want to first discuss batch normalization. So this was proposed in 2015. So, so this is an, you can think of this as a regularization and speeding up the training techniques. So let, let's go back what was happening back then. So in 2015, the computer vision community was completely now moved to deep learning. Whereas in NLP, I would say not many people were. Of course, there were a few very key works like uh, sick to sick and attention mechanism, but um, it was not as cl uh, clear as in computer vision community that the deep learning was basically, you know, replacing everything. And then back then, of course, one of a really the, the, the most biggest concerns uh, from the researchers' perspectives were how we can prevent the model from overfitting or going to bad minima. And also how can we speed up the training? And they, they, had, they had a few, of course, techniques to do this. One was the famous, very, very old, um, but still used actually, um, L2 regularization. So what this is, is hopefully you, you remember this, what this is from your machine learning class. So what you do is that you try to penalize loss if the weight becomes too big, the absolute value of the weight becomes too big. You penalize by a scale of some alpha, for instance. So your loss becomes something like, your new loss becomes uh, original loss, plus you have some alpha, and you just basically compute the norm of the weight and square it. And actually, no, I mean, I believe the, um, I wrote the notation wrong, not square, but just basically just the norm of the L2 norm of the weight, which is basically just a square root of the summation of the squares. So what this does is that it tries to tries to penalize the model if the weights are too big, and but it will have a zero penalty if weights are zero. But in this case, of course, your loss will be very bad, right? Because if you have just weights of zero, then probably you're not doing anything on, with your model. So you need to balance between these two um, terms, right? You need to minimize loss, but also minimize the weights, the absolute values of the weights. And this is a, a bit more clear if you look this in the, also more visualizable, if you look, in, look this into um, polynomial function fitting for very simple, I'll say 1D data. So suppose that you have a um, 1D data like with points like this, right? Then it's clear that this has to be something like, um, b plus ax, right? Because it's linear function. But then in some cases, you might be fitting a very high polynomial function, something like, you know, something like this, right? And of course, actually I drew it a bit badly, but um, what I meant was to be more exact, you actually pass these points if you pass these points, then your training loss will be zero or very close to zero. But it's clear that this doesn't seem to be right, which means, of course, this has overfit. In that case, then your, um, actually, my pen is out. again not working. So, actually, to be more generalized, so it's something like, a zero plus a one x, but you basically met, if you model this with much higher polynomial, then you will be some, doing something like a one x plus a two x squared plus a three. Oh my gosh, I think something's wrong with my pen. It's very bad news actually. Hmm. A three x Q plus, etc., And then here are the weights are A's, right? So if the A's are too big, then apparently 
your L2, uh, L2 term will be very big. So then you will be discouraging the model to learn high polynomial and try to learn much um, lower degree polynomial in this case, which is linear function, right? So basically you can think of L2 regularization as model try to fit lower degree function. And I mean, it, it encourages model to do that, of course, at the cost of uh, lower loss, I mean, higher loss. So I hope you get this point. But another um, technique was dropout in 2014. This was also very crucial in um, many tasks, including image classification and also NLP. And these two are pretty good, but the issue was that these two are very helpful for preventing overfitting, but they are not, they don't, didn't seem to work well when the number of layers are very big. And also it doesn't really boost up the training that much. It's just making the, um, it doesn't really help with the training speed. So there were, uh, so the best normalization was proposed to really take care of these things at the same time. So what this does is that, so why does the model uh, go to bad minima? And also why does model tr uh, training very slows down when layers get deep? It's because, I mean, at least what they hypothesize is that the, the distribution of the inputs in each layer changes a lot as you train more, which is obvious, right? Because initially you will have a, the weight, the input distribution, which is really um, very, um, I would say proportional to how you initialize the weights. But then as you train and the, as the weights get, for instance, bigger than maybe your inputs get too big in the, the higher layers, right? And that's not too good, especially given that you have a fixed learning rate, for instance, then you will have a very uh, different actual learning speed when the these weights become too big or too small. So the point is that what best normalization does is at, it, in, at each layer, you basically want to normalize these inputs across mini batch. And it's explained by this equation at the left. So let's say that you have a, a layer, which is just, um, you know, um, our layer is just basically a vector, right? For each sample. And you pass this vector to next layer to have a, a new vector. It's basically an iterative process, right? Vector matrix. Then that, that vector, we want to normalize across batch. So what we do is then we basically, you now for each dimension of the vector or matrix, we compute the mini batch mean here. Is blue. So we compute the mini batch mean. So what that means is that we go across different example in the current training batch and the computer mean. And then we compute also the variance using this mean. And then use these two terms to normalize it. And we get this um, x hat i. So it's, it's actually uh, one important thing is that, if, so what, what, what would happen if the, all the examples in this mini batch are just exactly the same, which probably would not happen, but let's, let's say that that happens. So for some reason that you have just training data that has that's completely uniform, then apparently this will have zero variance and mean will be exactly equal to every um, XI. So this will not change at all, right? But there is one more thing that's, Call shift uh, scale and shift. So that's basically um, so you normalize it and you basically scale and shift, and that's exactly this. And as you see, you have a two scale values, gamma and beta, and you multiply gamma to x. Um, so this is scalar. So you basically multiply this gamma for the same gamma for every dimension of x. And you also add a scalar value beta. And these two are jointly learned during the uh, training. 
So you have a, a room for scaling and shifting a bit. So it's known that this mitigates internal covariate shift. It's a very difficult term or a very complex term, but what that means is that really, as we said, the distribution of each layer's input changes as you train. And that's basically what the paper argues is not good thing. So we want to make the distribution back to normal distribution, which is more controllable and also more works better with the, our initial learning rate. And it's, it turns out that this is very essential for building very long, very deep neural networks. In 2016, there was a, uh, the ResNet was proposed for those of you who already took computer vision probably know what ResNet is. And in ResNet, for instance, it's one of the two key things were really necessary. One was residual blocks. And second was this best normalization basically that as essentially prevent gradients from exploding. So best norm and residual blocks. I told the residual is just simply adding the input and output of a certain layer as for the output, right? So these two are very essential for building super deep neural net. And again, my pen is not working. Very deep. So this residual blocks and best norm are very essential. And some people argue that, of course, maybe this is not the reason why best norm is working well. Um, some people argue that, for instance, it helps us to smooth the loss function or the objective function. That's what really best norm does. So there are different observations. We have, a, I don't think we have a very clear theoretical reason or reason why this is working super well, but it's pr pretty clear that best norm has been the standard in deep neural networks with residual blocks. So I think I had this page if I wanted to discuss anything, but I told you that again, best norm, um, it's also oftentimes abbreviated with BN. Hmm. My pen is not working. So, okay, here we go. So I want to say that BN plus residual connection is necessary just one second. Necessary for hundred plus layers of DNN in CV. Of course, in NLP, we haven't seen the need, or I mean, at least we haven't got to the point where we needed um, something like hundred layers yet. I mean, even GPT-3 is now hundred layers, but in computer vision, computer vision reached that, that level of layers very soon. Or I mean, in some sense, I think transformer has sub layers. So you can think of it as actually hundred plus layers too. So we're actually getting very deep, including sub layers. We can think of it as I think more than hundred these days. So best norm work is pretty important, but the but one issue was that best norm wasn't really working, working well with the uh, more of a sequence problems. There are several explanations for this too, but it's more empirical than anything super theoretical. So probably that's like one of the um, research topics that may, maybe some of you are interested in exploring. Why does layer norm doesn't work? I mean, batch norm doesn't work well with the RNNs or transformer compared to what we're gonna talk about, which is layer normalization. So layer norm is pretty simple too, once you know what batch norm is. So the difference between those two can be highlighted in this, in this diagram. Right. So here the N is 
of course, Leonom was initially also proposed for um, image too. So here C is channel for image, H and W are the height and width. So basically the, the dimension that the image has and C is the uh, color channel, you can think of it as more of. And N is the, um, the, num uh, the batch, mini batch. So in, in batch norm, you averaged over the mini batch, right? But in the layer norm, you do not average over N, but you average over C, which is basically the vector dimensions. So that was a, a bit difference, a really big difference actually from batch norm. Although how you, how you compute mean and variance, of course, is quite same, right? So this is very same. It, this is very similar, but, but the key difference is that this H is basically, so I'm sorry if it's confusing because this H is not the same H as the, the H in the diagram. So they are from different sources. That's why it could be confusing. But here the H is basically the, the size of the vector that we're talking about, the layer basically. So we're normalizing each dimension across layer. And we have also scale and shift, but the difference, another difference is that it's vectors, not scalars. So remember that in the batch norm, this value or scale values, that's identical across all the, um, all the values, right? But then in, layer norm, you will be learning vector that's will be acting differently for each dimension of the layer. And this also improves both training time and generalization performance, just like batch norm. And it has pretty similar effect to that of batch norm, but then it is actually very famous because it works really well with transformer and transformer will not work without layer norms. That's a really important thing, um, but it is not, theoretically super clear yet why there is such difference because they are still normalizing. One thing we can think of it as is that normalization across the, um, the hidden states or I mean the vector is, I would say, it's basically making the, um, you know, compared to batch, mini batch, mini batch you're comparing against the same thing, right? So we had this hypothetical situation that if you have really the same example in the training data, then um, you will not have any difference. You will be just outputting the same thing with maybe of course scaling and shifting, but in layer norm, even if all the examples in the batch is exactly the same, layer norm will be able to normalize something. So um, I think maybe that's like one key difference, intuition that we can think of it as but it's not super clear. Okay, so again, hopefully it's pretty clear how this works. Um, so yeah, we compute the mean variance and uh, for actually this is not variance, this is a standard deviation, right? Um, square roots of variance is standard deviation for those of you who um, do not recall statistics. And basically we just uh, scale it by, you know, this is the, the standard scaling, right? Scaling, I mean the normalization. And this is what? Scale. And this is shift. But of course we're scaling and shifting with vectors instead of scalars. So they're acting differently on each dimension of H. Okay, so hopefully up to here, everyone, every everything is clear. So please ask me if you have um, question about these. Okay, so yep, so um, layer norm. is that session for transformer. Okay, so this was proposed in 2016 and transform was proposed in 2017. So you get the uh, how the timeline works. It's also actually uh, also 
empirically has shown that this works well with LSTMs, RNNs, etc. And by pair encoding. So what, 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 what are we trying to do with by pair encoding? So by pair encoding is basically replacing the, the or improving the vanilla tokenization with space or maybe some fancy regular expression. So it's actually interesting to how the, the community really, I would say, um, evolved because by pair encoding, of course, this was not originally just proposed for NLP, but it was actually, the, it was known idea since 1994. And it's actually very similar to Hoffman encoding, right? So it's like a really good method for compression. And then for many years, actually in NLP community, people were using regular expression driven tokenization. So basically they tokenize with space, but sometimes they tokenize by the the punctuations, right? Like a, a period exclamation marks. So they basically create these all these exceptions. And then they also sometimes wanted to tokenize stop word. So they use something like, you know, prefix, postfix. They, they use linguistical, you know, roots, like Latin roots. For instance, maybe character is coming from a Latin word, C-H-A-R. Then they separate C-H-A-R and A-C-T-E-R. And also, of course, ER is something that also, also happens at the end that indicates the, it has the meaning of the, the acting, right? So um, you have a several subword tokenization with these, all these like really complex rules. So it was until like 20, I would say 15, 16, that people were still using super complicated tokenization methods. And I'm not saying these are bad, actually, especially when the, the amount of data is relatively small, then these tokenization methods can be more useful. And also maybe they are still useful in non-English domains such as Korean, but it, it's, but then in English, it's pretty clear these days that um, these regular expression or manually created tokenization is not as good as data-driven tokenization methods. And that's why modern NLP, English NLP models all use something similar to BPD. And BP is basically data-driven vocab construction and also tokenization. So what does it do? You can think of it this way. So the how you define your vocab actually is a more of an optimization problem because the simplest way to define a word is um, define it as every possible character, right? If you define it as every possible character, then for English or ASCII, you know that there are only 256 possible characters. Even then, of course, many of them are never used in daily lives, right? So less than 256 characters. So your vocab size will be 256 and you can cover everything but the problem here is that if you do this way, then the, 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 your sentence length will be too long because if you have 10 words and 50 characters, you're working with 50, 50 tokens instead of 10 tokens. If you tokenize by character instead of space. So you get the point the, there is a, this optimization problem between the length of um, the, each sentence and the size of vocab and also how many unknown words you will encounter. Okay, I have a question from Jinu. So um, let's try to go over this. Yeah, so by the way, please feel free to speak up. I know you have a trouble with that, but I mean, you can interrupt me anytime. You can raise hand. I think I gave you permission to speak up, right? Um, Yep. So when using padded sequence batches, how are the features from padded position handled inside layer norm? They could bias the layer statistics and might affect training. Good question. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, as you said, um, it's the best way is to ignore them. So um, how, how can you do that? Because you're actually computing the, um, your, what is it? You're, uh, you're normalizing, I mean, in, this is a problematic if you're working on, I would say, um, what is it? 
Yeah, yeah. So suppose so it's it's so suppose you have your best size one, right? Your if your best size is not one, I'm I'm sorry. So let's say your best size two, and you have one long sequence and you have one short sequence, and the short sequence has several paths, right? If if we want to parallelize it in GPU, but at the end what you want to do is that when you're computing layer norm with the, some recurrent neural networks or transformer, then um, there will be some, there will be some, um, I'll say, what was it? Sorry, I had a phone call. So, so you'll have a, some um, vector coming from the paddy tokens, right? And what you're saying is that how can we ignore that? And how you you could ignore that is because uh, when you're computing layer norm, you will be it will be best to actually it will be best to actually uh, when you're computing that put the mask into it and then um, just not um, you know count towards it, so that your layer norm layer norm will not be affected by um, by these padded sequence outputs, of course. And this is especially problematic if you're working on, of course, uh, recurrent neural networks or something similar, because you're actually, um, you're actually your layer is actually shared across different tokens, right? So, and you don't want to get the effect from the um, the padded token. But I mean, that's 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 a theoretical thing. But in reality, I think that's not super important because um, even that those kind of things can be learned. So that's what I wanted to say, because it's, I think um, it, it might affect training in the worst case, but in many cases, the model will learn to actually ignore that uh, because they will not be useful for the, the loss anyways at the end, right? So you can think of this way. So when you pad sequence, then you have pa these pad tokens and they're, th these are just there for filling the space, but from the model's perspective, every se sentence has same length. So for instance, if you're, um, sequence length is 32. I mean, the the if you want to pad up to 32 and you have one sequence that's 32 words and the other sentence that has like 16 words, then you will have a 16 padded tokens, right? Um, you can just consider it as an input too, why not? Yeah, so I think, but this is a really important question because in the initial, I mean, it's a, a more, there are some personal opinions here um, too, but in the more initial deep learning, I would say, um, era, in the in the early deep learning era, people thought that, oh, these petty tokens or these meaningless tokens will have a lot of uh, bad impacts on your training. So we need to really learn how to really ignore these effectively. But then at the end, what people have figured out is that it's not super important actually to really ignore them. We can just consider that as input too. And model will be smart enough to actually ignore that at the end anyways. So I hope that was, uh, that um, that's an answer for your question. Yeah, yeah. So in NLP, at least the modern NLP, you can assume that actually max length is uh, fixed, especially after BERT, because now we have a anyway pre-trained position encoding. So we need to position embedding. So we need to actually fix the position embedding to a certain length. Um, so you, you can't do anything anyways uh, on uh, after the 512, if it's, your length is 512. And also you, you don't have to actually, um, you know, worry about padded words unless of course you want to make it efficient. So I guess like the, the really answer is that the model is, the, the model is really usually sm uh, smart enough to really get around it. That would be my answer. Oh, and, and okay, okay, by the way, so um, what I wanted to say is hmm. Yeah, but I mean, still, you can still, you can mask it. I mean, because, um, yeah, so we can actually go over this in the next lecture too, but the point is that um, you can still also try to mask it. I mean, not inside layer norm, but um, but then also 
my point was that usually that's not super important in many cases. So, but we well let's let's try to discuss that. Um, you know, if you have more question later. Okay, so all right, let's get back to BPE. Okay. Mm. Yep. So, so coming back to BP. So, so I told you that the um, BP. So BP is basically completely data driven. And how that works is that you want to optimize between these two conditions, right? One is that you want to have uh, many vocab characters so that you do not miss anything. And also your sentence length will be short enough, but then also you don't want to have a too few vocabs, no, I mean too many vocabs so that um, in that case, then also you cannot actually, because at the end, the, the vocab, what's vocab used for is that you, you, have, you have to have a, you have to have seen the word during training time to make use of it during test time, right? So having too large vocab size is problematic too because you're learning one embedding per vocab word. And if you have like, a, say like 10 million vocab words and half of them have ne been, never been observed in training time, then your test will not, your, during test time, it will not work with those words that have never been observed because those embeddings will have never been updated, right? So. That's the, uh, the, the really the, the optimization that you want to opt, uh, really work on between two. So how BP works is it starts with character level vocab first that basically contains all the characters in the training corpus. Um, of course, uh, we first uh, tokenize the sentence into several words with space, first of all. So you have a sequence, you tokenize that with a space and then each word has characters and we basically consider all possible characters that these tokens have. So in ASCII, for instance, this will be only 256 character, uh, vocab words at max. And as you see on the left side, you iteratively replace the most frequent bytes pairs with a new token. So in you suppose that your word is a, 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 B, D, a, this one, and you see that there are two occurrences of double A. So you place that with Z, with Z equal AA. And then after that, you see that ZA and ZA are the, um, the most, actually not that one here, AB and AB are most frequent occurrences. So you replace the AB with Y, and then um, because there is a AB and AB, so you place this with Y, and then it becomes ZY, D, Z, Y, A, C, right? And now in the fourth step, now you place X, you, you place Z, Y with X because that's the most frequent observed by pairs, right? So you, you again do that so that at the end you have a very short sequence of words and you have uh, some, you know, X will be basically just A, 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 B, right? So then when you're decoding, you're, when you're trying to tokenize from the, um, during test time, for instance, or training time, when you see um, A, 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 B, you always replace that with X. So you try to place the uh, longest sequence first. And if not, then you go to next longest um, sequence that can be replaced with known, I would say vocab words. But the good thing here is that you still have A and C and D. So, in that case, you can still handle cases where um, very long tail cases, character level cases. So what happens with BPE is then you will be able to cover everything you want. I mean, you'll be able to cover everything without UNC if this is how you do it. Of course, given that if the initial vocab contains every possible character and this is fully data driven and you can loop this until you reach your target vocab size, there is no answer when the 
what the size of the final vocab should be. But in BERT, it was 30,000. So this is like very, um, I, I would say, um, often a very commonly used number that you try to target for when you're constructing vocab for English. Um, after that, other things are relatively, I would say, quite similar to BPE. It's just that um, word pieces are a bit different from BP in that um, it basically tries to replace a pair that's not most frequent, but one that maximizes the likelihood of the training data once added to the vocab. So this is a very hard way of explaining it. I'll just try to explain a bit, but I think it's not super important at the moment. It just try to think of it as, as the following. So suppose that you have a um, you're trying to, you're thinking about adding a new pair UG. And in the original um, BPE, you will be um, trying to add UG if and only if the occurrence of UG is uh, very large. But then now what you're trying to do in this word piece is that you're adding that if and only if the occurrence of UG, which is basically uh, similar to, or I mean, can be think, thought as a probability of UG, in the training corpus divided by prop u and prop g is the greatest. In other words, if there are a lot of u and g relative to ug, then combining ug won't be a priority. So you're only adding one thing that if there is a relatively small number of u and g, but there are a lot of a ug um, co-occurrences. So that's what the key difference between word piece tokenizer and BPE. But basically word piece can be considered as a variant of BPE. This word, this was used in BERT and Electra. And sentence piece is um, really the popular one that's being used almost dominantly these days. So the only difference from BP is that instead of tokenizing by space first, just consider the entire sentence as one word and then just do the same thing BP, right? Because you can think of space as a char uh, regular character instead of, instead of something that splits between words, right? then just do, actually this is like, I think more, more of a vanilla way of doing it, right? Other than word piece. But I think it was developed um, later because people were trying to put more of a inductive biases into these things by first splitting by space and then doing some thing on top of it. Another reason is that this is very reasonable for English, but then could be not so reasonable for non-English where there is not many spaces. In Chinese, for instance, as far as I know, you, you don't put any space between characters in a sentence. Then if you use word piece, then it's not really useful anyways, right? Um, you will not see any space. So um, basically sentence piece is trying to say, okay, space, even the space is uh, some, using space as a splitter is very biased towards English, but in many languages, space is not necessary or oftentimes used. So let's just consider space as a regular character. And then we can think of the entire sentence as one word and then just perform the BP on top of it. In that case, then you can think of the entire corpus as like more of a one giant raw stream too, right? Okay, so um, it's sentence uh, tokenizer is up to here. We'll be talking a bit about the um, decoding strategies and finish with the LM after three minute break. So please come back in three minutes. Oh, I have a question. So I'll answer this and then let's go into break. GPT series using different tokens with bird variants, right? Is there a special reason? Um, so as far as I know, so I have to recall this. I don't remember this really well, but um, if they use different variants, there probably is not super big reasons, except that they empirically found or they have some intuition that it's better. But I think if you're dealing with a lot of different languages, then um, sentence piece is usually better. If you're dealing only with English, then it's, um, it could be better to use um, word piece in some cases. But I don't think um, there are very strong, I would say, evidences that one is much better than the other in English. But this is, um, it's, uh, I have to double check though, so.
Does that answer your question? Okay, so a three minute break, we'll come back at 326. Okay, uh, so let's begin 
the rest of the lecture. Oh, there's one question. So from Uyang, it's uh, which of tokenizers is the best when we handle Korean? So sentence piece, word piece, BP, character level BP. I'm so confused because GPT Bart used BP, Bert used word piece, someone used sentence piece to Bert in English. But which tokenizer is the best to English and Korean? So I believe, so I have to double check this too because there are so many details like these days, but I'm, I'm sure GPT, when they say BP, they mean sentence piece, like really similar to a sentence piece. A sentence piece is a more of a term that Google made up to um, how they do uh, BP with the uh, uh, BP on the sentence level. So um, what I mean is that there is a specific package called sentence piece and that's basically implementing BP algorithm in their own way. So in that sense, GPT, GPT and um, I would say, um, GPT is kind of using sentence piece, right? But it's not using the Google sentence piece. They made it their own. So I'm actually looking up the paper right now too. So let's see. Okay, so I'm looking at the GPT-3 paper. So, so what it says is, Yeah, so I'll, I'll double check later, but um, looks like GPT is using their own BP, which is very similar to a sentence piece, I would say. That's what I, I know. That's, what I, how, that's what, how I understand the paper. So, and there were um, word piece in BERT and I think people, so I think it's more of a trend, right? I mean, I think as we go more of a, uh, I would say, so for instance, T5. T5 paper, I think also use sentence piece if I remember correctly. Let's take a look. Not, oh, there you go, yeah. So T5 used sentence piece and um, as you said, Bart used BP, which is also probably sentence piece, similar to sentence piece, but they are from Facebook. So maybe they didn't use a term sentence piece, which is from Google uh, repository called sentence piece. So I think there is a, there was a confusion maybe, right? Um, so except for BERT, I think you can think of it as many modern language models use sentence piece or uh, sentence level BP. Hope that's clear. Okay, so let's move to teacher forcing. So it's now we're talking about decoding. And what is teacher forcing? So remember that when we are training, so I'll actually try to draw here first. So I'm drawing in the second page. When you're training a decoder, so there's a, of course, um, let's, let's use the SIG to SIG instead of transformer for the explanation. That's easier probably. So our SIG to SIG was as following. So we have encoder and we use this as a memory for our decoder, right? So we do something like This is a output one, and then this should be output two. Output three and etc. And during training, we want to train for train the model so that they can 
generate this O1, O2, O3. Let's say there are the um, true labels. Then what should we fit in for this, this part during training? So actually teacher forcing is more of an obvious way to do this. So maybe at least like for people here, I think it's more obvious to really fit in the, the um, during training, um, your output labels, words shift by one word to the right. So it will be something like 01, 02, et cetera. But this is not really equivalent to how the model is, um, how the model will be, what, what the model will be encountering during inference time, because it is possible that you might get the word wrong. I mean, what if the model gets the first output wrong instead of 01? Um, let's say it got something else like 01 prime. So then during inference time, because you're feeding, feeding the previous output to the next input, instead of 01, the 01 prime will go in. And therefore, you never know what's going to happen with the model. So the, the point of teacher forcing is that basically we are tr giving the model what the uh, ground truth output was in the previous time step, or in other words, what the ground truth input is in, at, in each time step. And we only train for the output at each time step. This makes the model very um, easy to train because you don't have to really worry about anything like uh, reinforcement learning. We just have to basically try to predict what the word at each time is time position. But this behave this will be entirely different from fitting in the previous word, fitting in the previous word because that that your the, your model will not be trained for those cases where you have a wrong words in the first place. You're still always trained with the correct word at the current time step. So that's exactly what's called exposure bias. So um, probably, uh, I hope that you also uh, search for this and then maybe uh, read a few related articles about this. The point is that if you try to give the model the answer at each time step of the decoding, then you're, you're basically, your model will be biased by being exposed to the true labels. Whereas in the inference time, you will never know what the true label is. You will be only evaluate after you output everything, right? Not every time you output a word, you will be evaluated after, after you output the entire sentence. So, and there's no way that you know what the, 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 previous time steps, the previous time steps output should be during decoding. So that's a, it's a general term, um, actually more of a general machine learning term that basically saying that during training time, you're kind of cheating, not entirely cheating, but kind of cheating because you know what uh, your previous, previous output should have been. And that's why the model be very, might be at least theoretically not good during inference time you, if you're exposed to this bias. So um, it's, it's basically, um, you can think of this as more bias versus variance trade-off actually. So it's a very important problem in machine learning. So because you are increasing your model's bias. So you're not training exactly, you're not, your model will not be exactly trained to what you intend it to be but you're reducing the variance so much that the model actually trains uh, pretty effectively. And there is a, a lot of empirical evidence that um, this, does, this bias does not seem to severely hurt the performance though. That's why people are using this. Um, but one might want to use reinforcement learning such as policy gradient to avoid the bias but it has such a high variance that it doesn't really work well in practice. So it's really important to know this difference between bias and variance. Um, maybe it's not super easy to get it right now, but hopefully you get the, the point that, um, okay, you're basically, your loss function is not really the super good one 
but then maybe that's better in practice to make the model train much better than making the loss function exactly what you want it to be in that which in case the model doesn't really train well so you can think of it that way and teacher forcing is one of a way to induce a bias so that the model can be trained pretty well and easily at the end and without having too much difficulty of uh, uh, generating good sentence but of course this has a lot of uh, issues right i mean i mean not a lot of issues, but still there is an issue, right? So this is like one of the problems that happens during um, when you try to solve a problem using generate, uh, using, you, you, when you try to solve a problem as a generation task, because this kind of bias always adds up later and maybe hurting your model's performance at the end really severely. But maybe it's not too bad, right? So. Um, that's the empirical thing. And everyone uses teacher forcing these days, at least initial stage. Otherwise your model will be really not training well initially. So that's the, what I want to say. This allows us to avoid error accumulation in the early stage of training. So any question on the teacher forcing? So I was, just, I was just trying to tell you that this is a standard way that probably you know is a default. Everyone uses it. So you might think that's like the, the only way to do it. And that's like the, the only correct way to do it. But I want to say, of course, there are several, there could be several ways to do this, especially because teacher forcing actually is not really the, um, the correct way to compute your loss that optimizes for your output but it's like more of a trick that everyone uses. And next is exhaustive search, greedy search and BIM search. So hopefully these are not too um, new to many of you. So what is it? It's actually very, um, also oftentimes discussed in AI as a search problem. So quite simple, right? So you begin with, uh, you have this RNN decoder, right? Actually, I'll go one by one. So let's say you put start here and you decode one word. But when you're decoding this one word, what I'm, when I'm saying decoding, I mean that you choose the one that has the highest probability at this point. And then you feed that in. Suppose that you had like a two options at the end and W1 was something like 0 0.1, W2 was 0 0.2. Then probably you will choose W2, right? And then after that, um, you might have a, again, two choices. where the first word is something like 0 0.3 and second word is 0 0.1, then probably you will choose W1 of two, right? So you go so-and-so to get the final output at the end, then maybe your final output is something like W1, W2, W1, This is greedy search because you chose what your best decision is at each time step without thinking about whether the final output's probability will be the best. And is it possible that you will have a better, more probable sentence at the end, even if you choose less likely word at the first time step? For instance, what if you choose W1 instead of W2 in the first time step? Maybe that's possible because maybe something like if you chose W1, then maybe your choice was something like, maybe the, the first probably was 0 0.1, but then maybe in the second stage, you'll probably become something like 0 0.9, some word is. Then you'll be choosing that. 
And what will be the multiplication between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3? That will be um, 0 0.03. Shall we use black? But if you did 0 0.W1 and W1, then your probability would be something like 0 0.1 times 0 0.9, which is 0 0.09, which is much higher, right? Oh, my bad. So 0 0.2 times 0 0.3. So the, the first sequence will be 0 0.06. So even if you chose less likely word in the first time step, it's possible that you might be reaching more probable sentence at the end. That's the point of the, the point of a really search because you never know what will be the best at each time step. Greedy search is just simply choosing the best one at each time step. So what will be another option? Maybe you can do exhaustive search. Maybe you can look for every possible scenarios. I'm sorry. Okay, so hopefully you get the point what it means to do exhaustive search. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so you get the point, right? Then that's the difference between exhaustive search and greedy search. So what is beam search then? Because exhaustive search is very difficult because you'll have a lot of options at each time step. You'll have like, a, if you're a vocab size 30,000, you have a 30,000 options at each time step. Then you have to, uh, you have a 30,000 30, options in first time step. In the second time step, it's exponentially growing, 30,000 times 30,000, which will be 900 million. And it will be much bigger in the third time step. So it becomes basically intra intractable after like three or four time steps. So what Beam Search does instead is that you just keep track of, um, on the top K most likely sequences at any time. So that allows you to be tractable and also be able to also not just fall into this local greedy search, local minima search output, but you might be able to find a better output. For instance, in this case, with BIM search of a BIM size of like two, then you might be um, at, in, in the initial time step, you will be having both, you'll consider both cases of starting with W1 and starting with W2. And then you carry out your exploration with these two um, starting words for each, uh, we're independently carrying out the search for each starting word. And at the end, you might be able to find better ones. So BIM search is just keeping, um, um, this is keeping, top K, where the K is basically what people call beam size. Okay, so hopefully now you're, now you know what exhaustive search, greedy search and beam search is. And in practice, everyone uses beam search in, especially when you're trying to generate text because greedy search might be falling into very bad local minima, such as like degeneration. The exhaustive search, of course, is impossible. So BIM search is usually the, uh, the preferred way with BIM size, something like 10, 20, 50. So we have three minutes left. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea to really start with language model today. So next lecture, we'll start with language model and we'll cover other topics as well. So I think we'll end the class today here. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'll see you on Wednesday.